role that the forest wildlife specialists kind of find themselves in. It's, it's a unique opportunity. I think it's scalable to a certain extent and to see the, the addition of, of another person down in the Southeast. I think that's hopefully the, hopefully the first of many, right? That's right. Yeah. And we, um, basically what we do is, uh, help private landowners navigate, um, state and federal programs that are available for forestry, um, provide, you know, habitat and technical assistance, um, in regards to forestry and, um, basically develop habitat plans for uh, what I call non-industrial private forest landowners. Um, another term that's commonly used are family forest landowners. Um, and basically these are folks that are not industrial landowners, they're not public landowners. Um, they're, you know, folks that own a 40, an 80, um, and are looking to, to get the most out of their property and, and do what's right by the land. Yeah, definitely. I, I think grouse and woodcock hunting is often thought of as a public land pursuit. And for many folks, it almost entirely is. But hunting aside, we know that lots of grouse and woodcock live on private lands. And that's a that's a critical component to the health of bird populations and forests. And it's a key it's a, it's a point of interest for rough grouse society because of that, because of course the focus is much, much greater than, than the actual hunting and the pursuit of the birds. It's about the habitat, the ecosystem, healthy forests across the board. So private lands are a big component of that. Jared, you actually, you meant some, you made some comments in the film about like percentages of ownership and the amount of, the amount of forest that is actually privately owned. Can you, can you add a little bit more detail? Not that we have all the statistics and numbers in front of us, but what does it look like as far as the landscape is concerned? Well, in the state of Wisconsin, it's a little over half of all our forest land is owned by non-industrial private forest land owners. And the, the rest of the, um, the other 50% is a mix of industrial forest land um, and, you know, federal, state and county forest here in this state. Um, and that's a similar trend uh, really in all of the Great Lakes. So almost half of our land base um, is privately owned. Um, and it's a, you know, we can't really just throw that to the wayside right. and just focus on public land because it all interfaces, um, you know, together. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, that's, that's half your, half your forest. And in theory, half of, half of the potential habitat for these birds. So it's no, no doubt why that would be important to rough grouse society let's let's break down that film a little bit because interestingly enough i that was that was done by our team at northwoods collective and i'm familiar with a lot of the film shoots that we do for grouse and woodcock hunting and almost all of them are done on public lands as we as we hinted at before i think a few a few hunts that we've shot have been on private land uh, i think out east, uh, perhaps uh, rough grouse member Bruce Bennett. He's got some property out in, I believe, New York, and I think some some footage was taken there. But you, this film, you guys were hunting on private land, and it was in fact a family forest, which you told me about earlier. Tell me a little bit about that piece of property and kind of what you saw through the eyes of a forest wildlife specialist when you got to hunt there. Sure. So we were hunting on um, John Steigerwalt's. Uh, um, some of his family land. Um, he calls it the shack, even though it's a pretty nice cabin. It doesn't have electricity or indoor plumbing, but it, uh, it, it's maybe a step up from a shack in my book. But um, it's been in his family for many, many years. Um, his uncle owns a pretty good chunk adjacent to it. And um, yeah, it's a, it's a family force that's been in their family for many years. And theirs is actually protected in a trust in, in perpetuity. Um, and it means a lot to him and his family, but we did quite a bit of hunting, um, on the property, um, and on his uncle's adjoining, uh, property as well. So you're telling me the neon lights behind you when you were being interviewed there, they were being powered by a generator. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's cool. That's about all you need, I suppose, in, in bird country, as long as you got a little place to turn the lights on and turn the heat on at night, that's sufficient. Mm -hmm. Based on some of the cover that you were seen walking through, clearly the family forest on the Steigerwald property has not been a set it and forget it mentality. There's been some management there. Yeah, um, I think it was roughly a lot of it was about seven to eight years old. Um, there was a pretty large clear cut that 
Um, we hunted quite a bit of, um, you know, that is, that his uncle set up for a timber sale. Um, it was some pretty prime cover. Um, but when we were there, I also, you know, John and I kind of talked with his uncle and gave him some tips on maybe some different ways that he could manage it in the future and some programs that might, might help him as well. And he is already enrolled in some of the programs that, um, assist private landowners too. So, um, yeah, it was a very typical setup for a lot of folks that I work with. Yeah. Uh, just a couple of quick no, uh, housekeeping items for folks viewing. If you do have questions for Jared as the for forest wildlife specialist, uh, please feel free to share them, leave them in the comments below. We will get to those if we can. Jer as Jared said, he's in Northwest Wisconsin and his position is quite specialized as that's how these positions tend to be. So if you are, if you're in a different part of the country, I would think Jared might have some thoughts as to how to get you pointed in the right direction, talking to the right people, but Jared's territory is quite specialized, but please uh, feel free to leave those comments below. And also wanted to let you know that if the lights happen to turn off in Jared's office, he might have to stand up and do some jumping jack jacks to, uh, to get the motion detectors back on. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so can you, we were, we were chatting about this a little bit earlier today. Talk about, the importance of you specializing in a territory and you being in one place, of course, you got to live and work in the same place. That makes sense. But are there, are these programs specialized to different regions in the country where your knowledge of that region and what landowners might need, that's going to be helpful in that scenario? Yeah. You know, the, the farm bill is available nationwide, but every state um, it's set up quite a bit differently and states set their own priorities and their own practices. Um, so, every you know every state is different but then obviously every region to region um, varies quite a bit especially with forestry um, you know what i'm able to do and what i what are our current market conditions and um, contractors you know there's a wide array of things but you know there, there are certain things that we're able to pull off here that maybe we can't in other parts of the state or other parts of the country and you know we also have a lot of things going in our direction where i'm able to do um, a lot of projects that, you know, aren't as scalable in other parts of the, the area as well. So, you know, that's kind of one advantage of the farm bill is that each state has its ability to kind of set their own priorities on how their farm bill forestry dollars are spent um, to their needs. Uh, and, you know, RGS has been pretty involved in the state of Wisconsin as getting um, rough grouse and woodcock as a, a priority and a focal species of a lot of our farm bill forestry dollars. Um, we have a lot of partners that, you know, have really been on board with us. And ultimately that's what created, um, my position was, you know, just sitting down at the table with, uh, the folks at NRCS and talking about where their needs were, um, and how they wanted to develop their program. And, uh, it all started kind of with just a, a real basic conversation on, you know, what do you think about this? Yeah. So in your role, you certainly carry the rough grouse society american woodcock society flag but you mentioned those partnering organizations and when it comes to private landowners i think you know generally there is and i i know this from talking to you and i'll, I'll probably have you elaborate on it a little bit but sort of the the goals the dreams the visions of maybe there's probably no typical landowner that you work with but you see some some patterns and some consistencies between folks the, their goals and what they're trying to achieve on their landscape are oftentimes, I think, larger than grouse and woodcock. They're a component of it. But talk about what, from your your conversations with private landowners, what are they hoping to do? What are they hoping to accomplish most often? Well, there's certainly no secret that, you know, and it's been this way for a long time, but most people who own, you know, 40 or 80 want to shoot big giant deer, yeah. which, you know, we all do. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, you know, really a lot of times it, it, it takes some folks longer to get the big picture that good forest management is good whitetail management. It'll be yep. good grouse management. Um, and really, I think most of them that spend enough time in their property get beyond that and just enjoy seeing different types of wildlife and, you know, notice when certain types of wildlife go missing. And a lot of times the wildlife that goes missing is our young forest species um, like grouse and woodcock. Um, and I think a lot of them finally, you know, kind of put the pieces of the puzzle together that maybe I'm not, I'm not cutting enough or I don't really have a plan. That's what I, I find a lot of folks 
come to me as just saying, you know, I, I know I need to do something, but I really don't know where to start yep. and I'm overwhelmed. Uh, can we just go walk the property and tell me what, sh- what you would do. And, um, you know, that's another great, uh, part of being partnered with, um, NRCS and being tied to the farm bill is I can also come to them with some financial assistance to help get some of that done. Cause, um, you know, your average family forest landowner, the median income is, you know, 50,000 to $90,000 a year. Um, so your average person that owns a piece of, you know, private forest land is a pretty blue collar person just trying to, you know, pay their bills like uh, most of us on the phone call and, and, but also trying to manage their property to the best that they can. And there's certainly yep. no, no secret that that takes time and money. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, for sure. Well, I, I want to, I'm going to jot down economics because I want to chat about that a little bit and some of the unique opportunities that folks have when we're talking about timber and forestry, because I think that does change the economic conversation of land ownership and forest management in some very unique ways. But you did mention having that person, let's say you're, let's say you're at a rough grouse society banquet. You're at the grouse camp event. I know this happens again, just from talking to you and spending some time with you. You have somebody come up to you and they say, they've got a piece of land. They don't know where to start. They'd like you to come out and see it. Let's talk a a little bit about the process and how an interaction like that might proceed. Sure. You know, I get uh, folks from RGS, you know, I get folks that contact NRCS office that I get passed on folks from DNR foresters, consulting foresters. Um, You know, I get people kind of from all over the place. Um, But you know, with me, it, it all kind of starts with just a basic uh, site visit. Walk the property, see what their goals are, what they've already done, what they've got, you know, kind of how they they kind of look at the holistic view of how they fit into the big picture, too, um, can, can be really beneficial. Um, see where their comfort level is, see what they're, you know, capable of pulling off, too. Um, you know, I work with some folks that are really good with the chainsaw and can probably get a lot of stuff done on their own. I, you know, other folks that, you know, definitely can't. Yeah. Um, so really just figuring out what their goals are and sometimes help them develop tangible goals to accomplish. And a lot of, quite frankly, a lot of people own property with uh, the only real goal is to just enjoy it and hopefully shoot a couple deer every year. Um, that's not really a real goal. Um so helping them develop goals, I find on that first initial site visit is a lot of times what uh, what I'm really trying to get out of them is just get them to think about what do I really want to do here. Right. Is there, when we're talking about the size of a parcel, because of course that's going to vary, you could have, you know, the back 40, the family forest, 40 acres, but you're going to, I'm sure you've walked many properties that are larger than that. Is there a, is there a threshold? Is there a size of property that's too small? How does the conversation change as that property grows? What are some of the things to consider in that regard? Yeah, I, you know, I would say my smallest project is a forest land owner that owns 10 acres and I have a client who owns about 1500 acres is my biggest, you know, really yeah. once you're getting beyond 1500 acres, um, you know, at least in Wisconsin, you're probably entering into an almost industrial forest uh, operation. Um, You know, really there are probably half a dozen people who own more than that in the state. And oftentimes they, you know, they, they exceed some of our uh, income eligibility for the farm bill. And a lot of times if you own that much land, you probably should have your own consulting forester on staff too. So that, that would kind of be the scope, but I, you know, really the process is kind of, it, it's really similar. The only difference would be, you know, on 10 acres, we can probably look at about every single tree in a morning to where on a thousand sure. acres, um, you know, that the importance of getting a, a, you know, a forester and getting multiple people involved to develop um, a, co- a more comprehensive forest management plan is, is pretty important. You know, I, planning is, is, probably the most important part of forestry, whether you own 4 million acres, like, uh, you know, some of our larger, um, uh, national forests do, or if you own 10 acres, uh, they all need a plan. And really that plan for forest land is pretty much the same, no matter how much land you own, you need to know what type of timber you have, um, 
how you access the timber, what the co- potential commercial value is, what problems you have with it. Yeah. Um, and you know, really just developing what you can do with what you have is, is the, the most simplest way to describe a, a forest management plan. But yeah, um, that, that is of the utmost important, regardless of how much land you own is, is getting a forest management plan. And that, that's part of that, that goal setting too, is, you know, entering into a forest management plan, you need to have some goals. You know, your, your goal can be to have a whole bunch of wildlife, but you know, what type of wildlife do you want? Is it, is it grouse that, that you want, you know, is it, are there certain threatened and endangered species you want to manage for? Um, do you want to manage with an emphasis on commercial value? Um, you know, all of those are, are definitely considerations and depending on what user group, you know, you're dealing with that, those, those goals can change really for private forest landowners. Um, you know, they're usually pretty simple of just doing what's right. Um, and just trying to manage for a wildlife friendly and, uh, you know, a practical, uh, a practical scale for, yeah. for smaller parcels too. Yeah. I do see a, we've got a question in here from David and I'm going to ask you this. It's somewhat related to the planning conversation because I imagine this would be for somebody whose goals were, well, I'm going to make some assumptions here on David's question. He's asking what percentage of the forest should be one to 10 years old. So I'm going to assume that because of uh, where we're at and what we're talking about, David is interested in rough grouse and woodcock on this property. If somebody asked you that, is that too black and white of a question? Would you need more information or what could you say uh, with respect to that question? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. And you know, that I would say that's um, at a really big picture landscape level type of question. Sure. You know, uh, I think that the 10% um, to 20% depending on where you're at and the grouse range is thrown around quite a bit. Um, You know, that's a, that's a good goal, but if you own a smaller parcel, that might be, you might have 50% in that category, or you might have 0%. Um, So, but on a landscape level, it's, it's at 10% to 20% um, generally speaking, but how that 10 to 20% of, you know, what we call young forest, that basically young forest is a forest that's less than 20 years old. Yeah. Um, you know, how that intermixes with your other forest age classes is, is really the real, uh, where the rubber meets the road with grouse management too. We have a, um, you know, some of our counties uh, here in Wisconsin have a lot of young forests, you know, and some of the land or the, um, you know, different counties and stuff have maybe more than 20%. But how does that fit in with their other timber types and landscape? It might not be as conducive to rough grouse as maybe it could have been if, uh, you know, we had come to the table and helped them figure out, you know, maybe a, a longer term plan too. So sure. I, I, I think that, um, you know, sometimes like I need setting really stringent goals like that um, can be a little bit of a a sticky wicket in some regards too. Um, really the land is ultimately going to tell you what you're capable of and you know, where, where that's going to lie. So. Yeah. It makes sense to have some parameters to work with. And like you said, throw around the 10 to 20% number, but it also makes a ton of sense that every property is unique. Every landowner is unique. So there's going to be a ton of nuance to any of these conversations. Yeah. And I think one thing that a lot of private landowners, um, don't do is they don't look at their neighbors and talk to their neighbors enough to, you know, if you are, you know, looking at setting up a timber sale um, and your neighbor just cut a year ago, you know, maybe you should wait a few years. So you have more age class interspersion or um, if neither of you have cut in a really long time, you know, maybe you should go in together and try to, you know, maximize the bang for your buck, so to speak too. Um, And, and also figure out how you fit into you know, the section that your property is located in, how you fit into the county. Um, you know, if you've spent some time on the public land around you, what things do you like that they've done? What things don't you like that they've done? Um, because, you know, that can be a, a pretty good barometer too. When I work with people, it's like, well, you're, you know, your property kind of lays out like this and the county or the state did a timber sale that's kind of similar to what's proposed in your plan uh, just around the corner. You know, maybe you should go take a drive or a walk through that and, you know, see, see where your comfort level is and, you know, get an idea of maybe some of the things you 
you would like to see different or, you know, if you can live with it too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. I, I could, I'm not a, I'm not a landowner in that sense. I don't have a family forest myself. I hope to someday, but it's, I could imagine being very narrowly focused looking at my land and, you know, almost knowing, knowing every single tree. But when you're talking about planning, taking a step back to look at some of the other, the higher level landscape around you and private landers. I've heard conversations about sort of getting a cohort of neighbors and landowners together to talk about cutting. Does that work its way into your conversations with folks where maybe you have a logger come in, it's, you could split some of the costs for this logger to come in and cut a little bit on property A and property B. How does that stuff play out in, from your experience? Yeah, I always recommend that to people, but I guess uh, to kind of take a step back, one thing that I do uh, or and don't do is, you know, I basically do the planning and give people the tools and a plan to um, set forth. And a lot of that is non-commercial work or basically things that are not timber sales. Okay. Um, and a lot of times I pass them off onto a consulting forester in our state to actually administer the timber sale. Um, so but I, you know, it is part of giving people the tools on how to meet their goals. That's definitely something I talk to people about a lot is you really need to talk to your neighbors. Yeah. Um, so it's part of the conversation. Um, but a lot of times I, I'm not necessarily the one um, as a consultant sending the letters out or slinging the paint, so to speak. Sure. Sure. A lot of consultants do that, um, you know, really all over the country. Yeah, you because know, it's, it's good business for them too. Is to, you know, it, it and it, most of the time it's it's part of a stipulation in a timber sale to contact the neighbors and let them know what you're up to. Yeah, it's like the guy that comes up and he, uh, you had a storm come through the town and he's cleaning up trees and then he's passing out flyers all over the place. Hey, I'll clean up your trees too, right? <laughs> yep. Yep. Yeah. And uh, that, that can be dangerous too, because loggers do that. And, you know, <laughs> uh, I always recommend that folks utilize a consulting forester. Too. Sure. That's sure. a big part of my job is, uh, you know, and that's something that's kind of come up um, quite a bit recently in our new model too, is how are we going to engage with the consulting yeah. you know, forester base? Because we have a really, uh, really strong consulting base. And, uh, you know, to kind of explain what a consultant does is basically they're a, a private consultant. Um, a lot of time there's, um, uh, they're in business for themselves or they work for a firm, um, that sets up and administers timber sales for private landowners. Um, so they are kind of the, the one painting the trees to be removed, painting property boundaries, uh, bidding timber sales out to loggers, uh, administering the sale, basically making sure everything goes right. And, um, the wood that's going out is what was agreed upon and everybody's getting paid. Um, so they're kind of the middleman between the logger and the landowner. Um, and a lot of times that, you know, I, I'm, I'm always, you know, giving people a list of consultants in our, in our area. Um, and a lot, of, a lot of, um, consultants come to me with clients, um, with problems that are kind of that non-commercial in nature. Um, you know, basically saying like, Hey, I've got, you know, this problem on this property and the, you know, the, the landowners interested in how they can, you know, maybe get some assistance to deal with it. Um, you know, do you have anything out there and can you work with them to get that? So, you know, we're, we're nowhere near competing with consulting foresters. We're, you know, basically increasing their workload and trying to make things easier for them and how they interact with their clients too. Sure. Jared, do you speak the forester paint lingo? Like if you see paint on trees in the woods, do you know what it means? Yeah, but everybody uses, uh, <laughs> everybody kind of has their own language depending on where you're at in the country. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, I, I do um, to some extent. Well, I was hunting a piece of county forest in Wisconsin on, this would have been last Sunday, and I made my way through the Aspen Cut got right to the hardwood oak edge, right where you told me I should be, Jared. And I saw on a big oak tree, there was three red dots. And I was, I was in my head, I was making the assumption that that must have meant stop cutting there. Would that have been right? Mm, potentially that's probably the corner of their cut boundary. Okay. Yeah. So it usually, was, it was a corner type location. Yeah. So generally three hashes is a, a corner. Okay. Um, and then a, a red is generally a cut boundary. 
Um, so if you're going to do, you know, say an Aspen clear cut, but um, you're not cutting right to the property boundary, you'll probably run the perimeter in red um, and okay. then mark corners in three hashes um, or little jogs in two. Um, so, um, and then orange is generally, you know, like a single tree selection. Some people use red and then blue is generally a property boundary. So if you're hunting public land and you run into a very heavily marked blue paint in a straight line, uh, you should probably check your GPS cause you're potentially about to trespass. So pull up on X at that point and <laughs> yeah. make sure you're yeah. staying on public. <laughs> yeah. Blue paint is kind of your turnaround. Don't drown. I did not know that. So I learned something new tonight. <laughs> yeah. It's funny enough, actually, when I was hunting that piece on Sunday, I was with a county forester and I failed to ask him back at the truck. So I figured I'd ask you, Jared. <laughs> He's probably the one who put up the paint. Uh, uh, he probably was. Yeah. There are, there are many, many places I hunt in that county that he has, uh, he's been the one that set up the, set up the sale. So pretty cool. I, I enjoy all of my time spent hunting with yourself, Jared, and other folks in the forestry industry because of the, really the unique relationship that grouse and woodcock habitat cover has with forestry and forestry professionals. And uh, I just get a lot of enjoyment out of understanding more, much more than, than I ever did without the, you know, the educational background that folks like you have, which I find pretty cool. Talking about the, the forest management plans again, just before we kind of leave that, somebody doesn't have a forest plan, forest management plan today, they want to get one, they come talk to you. What does that look like as far as, I, I know there are, there are financial resources available to folks to get them a forest management plan. Are they going to be paying for this thing or are there, are there some instances where they can get a forest management plan for free based on some of these grants and other funding resources? Sure. There's some money available in the federal farm bill to have plans prepared, um, which, you know, it's a flat rate payment. Uh, so that can kind of vary how much it costs throughout the country. You know, here in Wisconsin, a lot of times it costs the landowner not, next to nothing or nothing other than some paperwork. Um, uh, you know, on really small parcels, I do a little bit of plan writing. You know, the, the reality is, is that a, a good plan can take quite a while, um, sure. especially for clients that are looking at doing a timber sale um, immediately. I usually recommend that they get with a consultant. Um, my plans are more of like a, a thousand foot view of different stand types and what your immediate options are. Um, the DNR foresters here in Wisconsin, write Uh, some plans, depending on where you're at and what their workload is like. Um, but you know, I, it, it, it varies. I would say, you know, if you want a thousand foot view of what you got, and what you can do with it, um, you can usually, um, you know, get, get a plan prepared by, you know, some type of agency or partner, um, for probably about nothing. Um, but if you're really ready to step up to the plate and do some some actual timber sale work and cut some trees, um, you know you're probably going to have to pay a consultant at some point because that those types of plans um, take a lot more time. You know, basically you're figuring out how many board feet cords. You know, you're that's a a much nittier grittier plan that takes a lot longer to to prepare. So yeah, um, it's kind of the precision versus accuracy thing. Um, you know, do you need a real precise plan or a real accurate plan? Um, do you need a plan that's more narrative or do you need a plan that's more boards and cords and how much do I have here? Um, so just like anything, you know, there, there's variations into the detail of, um, you know, what, what goes into a plan. My plans are very narrative. I'm basically telling the landowner a story of, you know, here's, you know, the different timber types you have and your options and the quality and, you know, the, the potential wildlife usage that is in those. Yeah. Got it. Well, let's talk a little bit about the economics of timber markets and the cutting of trees to the best we can. And I'm curious right out, right out the gate, are you seeing, are, and if you don't get there, in your work, just, you know, you could just tell me that, but are you seeing changes in the wood markets and what the landowners that you're working with, what they're able to do right now in the COVID-19 pandemic versus a rewind 12 months ago? Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, the, the, the big thing to, to keep in mind is that not all species and uh, types of trees and quality of trees are created equally. Yeah. And uh, most of our trees um, and 
timber mills all specialize in some type of forest product. Um, so for example, if you have a mixed timber sale, say you've got an oak stand that you're cutting, uh, maybe an aspen clear cut, um, and then you're doing like a, a northern hardwood thinning, which is pretty common and um, really most of Wisconsin, we have a, a lot of diversity in timber types. Uh, yeah. It's pretty common for a, a small property to have several different types. All those different wood products are going likely to different places throughout the state in different mills that make different types of wood products. Um, and, you know, sometimes there are certain wood products that do really well while others kind of flounder. Um, and depending on when you're cutting, you know, different mills and might be utilizing different, different rates of, of product. So, you know, we sure. had a, a, a large mill closure, um, that bought, uh, hardwood pulp. Um, so basically that would be, uh, maple, uh, a lot of maple, uh, ash, um, basswood, um, things in your Northern hardwood category that don't meet saw log criteria, um, because of quality or, um, uh, size of the tree. You know, a lot of the, the top of the tree is generally, um, what we call pulp. So basically it's a very small diameter stick. Um, you know, that, that market really dried up and, and that mill processed about 25% of our total cut timber in the state. Um, so what I'm seeing a lot of is, you know, a lot of people are still able to sell, um, the Aspen, uh, the good quality saw logs, um, you know, and, and a lot of the pine sales are still going okay, but, um, a lot of that pulp product is still sitting on the landing. So, yep. you know, for example, I met with a landowner a few weeks ago who had some storm damage. Um, he got a cut, but, uh, you know, he, he still had an awful lot of wood decked uh, on his landing. And, you know, I was like, yeah, I, it's like, is this all the hardwood pulp pile? He's like, yeah, you know, the consultant told me that he's not really sure when this is going to go. And, you know, that, that's just kind of a reality that we have to deal with. But, um, you know, at different times over the last 40 years, different products have come in and out of fashion too. Sure. So, you know, it's not uncommon for us to deal with some of these issues, uh, in the forest products market, you know, our, our pulp is a, is an important product in our state, but it also is, it's kind of, kind of boomer bust because a lot of it is paper. Um, yeah. and it's certainly no secret that we're using a lot less paper, but, um, industries that are seeing a lot of growth are, um, you know, what we call like engineered wood products. Um, so things like, uh, uh, OSB plywood, uh, oriented strand board, um, you know, that's, that's a pretty good, pretty good and stable market. Um, yeah. that's where most of our Aspen, uh, goes, uh, right now. Some of it goes to, to paper. Um, but really our biggest consumer is a, a lot of these places that are making, uh, engineered wood products. And, um, you know, my opinion, you know, that that's kind of where maybe we need to be doing some, um, uh, some R and D is how can we grow our engineered wood products? Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, it, it's complicated too, because, you know, uh, they call it hardwood versus softwood for a reason. And, and you can imagine that a tree that's a lot harder is a lot harder to grind up into a pulp product. Um, so th there's always complications and, you know, forestry is kind of nuanced in that it's as simple or as complicated as you want to make it. Once you sure. get into the actual product side of things, that's, that's where things start getting uh, really complicated. Cause you know, especially in our, our, modern markets we're dealing a lot with exports um you know a, a huge percent of our saw logs are exported um even a lot of our engineered wood products are exported um and then we also you know there's a lot of a lot of timber harvest out west uh and in the you know southeastern uh you know part of the the country and as well as you know canada and you know, it's, I, you know, I bought a, a two by four from Menards, which I wouldn't recommend doing, but, uh, you know, it came from <laughs> I New Zealand. Those this summer. <laughs> New so, Zealand, really? Yeah. And, and Rice Lake, Wisconsin, uh, you know, several, uh, um, you know, uh, timber mills within an hour of, uh, of there. And I got a two by four from New Zealand. So it's pretty incredible. At, you know, and uh, really all our products are like that anymore, but you know, yeah. wood, wood products are certainly not exempt from, from that level of complication. Yeah. 
Yeah. No, I think that's, it's really important to have, to have a grasp of the concept of these, a global market. I mean, a truly global market that is influencing what is happening with the t- products that are coming out of the forest in my backyard, in your backyard, in the viewer's backyard. I mean, it's really, those are the factors at play. And I think th- that's like the delicate tightrope that I think an organization like Rough Grouse Society is walking every day to try to work within these these timber markets to try to create and maximize the most habitat for rough grouse and woodcock. I mean, I think it's, it's incredible really. And having that global perspective, let's bring it back down to the landowner. Cause I, I wanted to get to sort of the economics on the back 40, if you will. And I think I recall a conversation you and I were standing around the tailgate after we had run our dogs on, on uh, some Wisconsin sharp tails. And you said something to the effect of, you don't buy land, you don't buy timber as an investment, really. There's there's much more to it than, you know, thinking you're going to buy a piece of property, cut all the trees, sell it, and flip it. I mean, that does happen, I think, to a certain extent. But for the most part, mm-hmm. I think the people that you're working for working with, there's a value in the wildlife. There's a value in the property. And that's what makes makes this thing go around. So talk about the economics of cutting trees on someone's personal property and how that could affect their pocketbook positively or negatively. Yeah. So yeah, there's certainly no secret that, you know, timber is a very long-term investment Um, and generally your return on investment, you know, I've heard as high as 6%, but I think the reality is it's probably more like one to 2%. Um, So most of the time you'd be better off putting that into a savings account. But the reality is, is with, uh, you know, forest land is that somewhere where you can recreate and enjoy. Um, And, you know, there's, um, you know, the advantage of having an active timber management program is not only are you creating better habitat for wildlife, but if you take that money and invest it back into the property, it can help you pay for your taxes. Um, It can help you pay for infrastructure for your next timber harvest, um, you know, one thing that uh, you know I see over and over again is uh, creating roads and trails and maintaining roads and trails is super expensive. You know, I would say especially when I meet with people who recently bought the property, everybody is super stoked to get in there and create a ton of trails, and they yep. very quickly realize for one how difficult it is and um, you know how expensive it is to pay a professional to do it. Yeah. Um, you know, so I always tell folks is like you know you're you're probably not going to get rich on the, the timber sale. But you're going to have a little bit of a, a, a slush account to, uh, you know, do the things that you want to do immediately. Um, and then if you, you know, kind of put that money back into the property, help you, you know, maintain that property in the long term. Um, and that's, you know, also kind of where the programs that I work on is, you know, depending on your property, you might only be entering into a timber harvest every 15 to 25 years. So. Sure. In an average person's lifetime, that might be, you know, two, maybe three times uh, yeah. if you buy the property when you're really young. You know, most people buy property when they're close to retirement. Uh, so they might only really be having one timber sale um, unless they own a pretty large property. Um, but, you know, things pop up in between there. You know, there's, um, you could have an invasive species infestation. Um, you could have, you know, things like, uh, some competition with regenerating oak or other species before the timber sale that you, you know, need some financial assistance to deal with. Um, you know, even doing some tree and shrub planting to enhance what you've already had. Those are all things that cost money. Um, then I also do, you know, a lot of work with, um, what we call like non-commercial timber types, like uh, tag alder, um, you know, even like things like black ash swamps and that are really important habitat types for rough grouse. But, you know, there's, there's, they're pretty cost prohibitive to actually manage, even though there is a lot of value in managing that. Um, so there, there's value for that, uh, for wildlife and there, there's money available to help people manage that um, and help them offset the cost of you know, kind of kicking their habitat up a notch, so to speak. But, um, you know, I would say without that timber management program and that management plan, um, you know, it's not worth a whole lot, but once we have that in place, all these extra little things really start to add up into some really, really, 
um, good habitat too. So um, where I, I kind of step in in that period in between timber sales where people are wanting to do something, yep. but they're not sure what to do or they're not sure, you know, what step to take next. Sometimes, you know, that next step might be in the next couple of years. Um, you know, I just wrote a, a plan for a guy who's, um, you know, his first entry on the plan that I wrote him is going to be in 2030. Um, wow. So, and the, you know, that's just the property he has, that's, you know, just kind of what, uh, that's how it lays out, but he just yeah. wanted an idea of, um, how can I regulate my Aspen to be as good as it can be, um, and keep it commercial. Um, and you know, that's kind of what we agreed to. So it, uh, it's all over the board, so to speak, but. Yeah, no, that's, that's really cool. I mean, it, it starts with, you got to know what you have before you can, before you can determine where you want to go and how you want to get there. Right. That's exactly right. And there's also a lot of, um, state programs too, that provide, you know, tax incentive for active management. Um, yep. every state's kind of got different programs out there and, you know, a lot of people are just like, you know, what, what's the pro and con of this? And even, you know, the reality is that they do contact a consulting foresters. Those folks are trying to make a living and they're going to send them a bill. Um, so, you know, I talked to a lot of folks just like, you know, what, do, what do I need to come to the table with to make this, you know, as cost effective and time effective for everybody. Um, once I'm ready to actually, you know, come to the table and do something. Sure. Um, so, you know, my advice, uh, I don't send people a bill, you know, I'm, I'm a free service to them. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I basically get them headed down the right road, um, give them an idea of what they can do and, and how to be successful with very few to no strings attached. Um, so you're, then, you're a good first call. That's exactly right. And, <laughs> you know, the reality is, is most of the people I meet with um, are not Rough Grouse Society members, you know, I'm sure most people listening here probably already understand a lot of the things we've been talking about, you know, the yeah. need for active management, the need for a plan. Um, so I can't think of a better way for rough grouse society to spend our time and money than trying to reach people that either don't know anything about us or don't know anything about forest management and right. meeting with them one-on-one -on, -one on their land where they're comfortable um, and talking to them about, you know, the importance of management and what we do. Um, and, not always preaching to the choir, so to speak, you know, we, we've really got to do a better job of reaching people that really don't understand forestry, forest products, uh, forest management. Um, you know, I've, I've seen it compared to, you know, farmers have done a really good job of telling their story about how they feed the world. Um, sure. But I don't think we've done as good of a job of telling that story with how important forest products are to, our local economies, you know, our day-to-day -day lives. Um, and, uh, so yeah, it, it all starts with small conversations and the more people we can have out there, uh, on, you know, people's property and on the land and, um, you know, at outreach events, um, with the rough grouse society on their shirt, I think that that is, um, a win-win. And in many cases, you know, like in my position, majority of the money comes from partners. Um, so, yeah, uh, it's kind of a kind of a no brainer, but uh, you know we obviously need our our member support, and um, we all need to be good advocates for uh, young forest and rough grouse society. So, well, Here's Jared, up. the lights the lights never did turn off. I was really <laughs> no. hoping to see you do some <laughs> jumping jacks, but uh, I, uh, I I can't thank you enough for coming on and and sharing the conversation with us tonight. And I think you, man, I I can't think of a better way to end it than the way that you just did. So keep, keep doing the good work that you're doing, keep doing the outreach and talking to the folks for myself as a rough grouse society member and the organization. I appreciate it, man. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thanks for having me. I just wanted to pop on real quick at the end. Um, I know we're wrapping up. We've got one question and I know, um, that, uh, Jared, you're going to hop off real quick, but real related to what you were talking about with expanding the message, we've got one last quick question. Hopefully do you have any, insight or any information or research related to the value of replacing plastic packaging with wood packaging or how do we expand that oh man yeah that's or is that too long if it's too long I, you know maybe we can follow up with the person i can pull their name um you know that's that's a big level question uh you know that i think that that's one of those questions that um um you know it's it's complicated when we're looking at anything that's single use um 
you know, I, I think that as a society, we need to get away from anything that's single use. And what we really need to be focusing our wood products on are things, um, replacing things in long-term structures that are plastic. So the desk uh, that I'm currently at my computer on is mostly made out of plastic um, and really poor quality um, you know, wood product. It'd be a lot nicer. You know, obviously everybody wants a beautiful oak desk, but if this could be made out of like a Aspen engineered wood product, that's a lot more sustainable and it's going to last a lot longer. Same yeah. with engineered mass timbers and buildings. Um, you know, basically I think we need to look less at, you know, the single use aspects uh, of replacing, um, you know, you know, replacing uh, with wood products and, and look at things that will be on the landscape for a really, really long time. You know, we built the entire city of Chicago on Wisconsin white pine. Um, you know, there's no reason we can't get back to that level of importance of, uh, you know, Midwest wood products too. Um, so I, I think that's really where the conversation needs to go is, you know, how can we, and that, that's also a bigger thing when it comes to um, when you look sure. at uh, carbon as well. You know, when we're looking at carbon sequestration and storage, we really need products that store carbon and don't get burned up or thrown in the wastebasket. Um, you know, we need things that are going to be around a long time and, and we can do it. We just have to have the political willpower, but um, we'll get there. It's complicated. Well, I, yeah. I, I realize we're over time, and Nick, I apologize for coming in and steal your thunder. You did an excellent job. No problem, up. man. I wanted to make sure that got, got wrapped up. And, and thank you both for contributing to Celebration Days. It's been wonderful to have you on, and I've certainly learned a lot. Um, so thank you all so much. For those folks that are viewing, uh, we're going to end this session. I'll click us over to the next session and get everything queued up. So just sit tight, and we'll be back with you shortly. Utilize the time well. Go click that Celebration Days auctions and raffles link. And, Get your raffle tickets and get some bids in. Thank you all.